even just today, he says it is time for Alberta to play hardball. There should be a, a new equation. No carbon taxes anywhere till Canada sees new pipelines and oil flowing at sane prices to international markets. Uh, I agree, and I can tell you, Rex, after the next provincial election, Alberta will be playing hardball. So, friends... I'll just close with this, because it, as was always predictable, the, the, the growing voices of intolerance in our public discourse are now trying to, as they would say in their nomenclature, de-platform Rex Murphy. So thank you to the Manning Center for providing this platform to Rex Murphy. And I'll just close by this. I can't think of a, better, of a, of a person uh, who's better qualified not only to receive platforms in this province, but I think, actually, he should be an honorary doctor of the University of Alberta, don't you? <laughs> you ladies and gentlemen, Rex Murphy. Really wonderful to be before such a neutral audience. <laughs> I was I was up in Whitehorse uh, a couple of days ago, and they had they had a picket. <laughs> there were only six or seven of them, so they obviously thought I was a small lawn. <laughs> uh, you have no idea how much it cost me to pay Jason to do that. <laughs> uh, it will live in shame for both of us. Uh, I should say, first of all, the obvious thing, um, thank you very much for allowing me to be here. Uh, I don't get out very much, and rarely, <laughs> and rarely by invitation, and even more rarely, welcome. Uh, secondly, the other reason, of course, is that you know, when I was at, at CBC, especially with the checkup a couple of years ago, uh, about this time of day, yeah, it's about mid-afternoon, about this time of day, they used to send me down from the fourth floor down to the main lobby of that great temple of political correctness on Front Street. <laughs> and, and it was my duty then to water the ferns. <laughs> and, and light the candles. And refresh the incense that we have there in front of the statue to Bishop Suzuki. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, cannot imagine, you cannot imagine how bad it feels not to be doing that right now. Of course, it's also very intimidating to be here. Uh, having worked so long at CBC Radio, I'm not used to audiences. I might add that having worked so long in television, I'm not used to intelligent ones. <laughs> Obviously, I don't mean that. <laughs> Yeah, it is very good. It is a high treat. I want you to know that uh, just flying in here, I, I realized that I was in the same skies that once transported uh, Leonardo de Chinook. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and Neil Young. There's a few strings loose on that guitar, let me tell you. <laughs> when, when they were habitating themselves to the wilds of Fort McMurray. So it's, it's a good thing to be here in, in, in the land that they have traveled and to follow in the jet trails of... By the way, remember, did you know that Neil, Neil Young had a 1954... Uh, was it an Imperial? Or a, oh, 1954 Lincoln. It had an engine in it that was bigger than most aircraft carriers. <laughs> and he used to transport that around by jet. So this is the kind of man who actually cares so deeply about carbon taxes. Uh, i got to mention one other thing. How many of you are aware of the, the price of a moose on, on the East Coast these days? <laughs> you follow that? Yeah, they did a call in Cape Breton, and, and they paid $7,900. Not for the moose, just for the shot. I mean, we have assassins in Newfoundland that are doing it for a dime. <laughs> But I saw that item, and they said $7,900 a moose to conduct a, a call for, I presume, the Department of Natural Environment or Climate Weirding. Uh, 
you know, you're getting $7,900 a moose and you're selling oil by the barrel for 14 bucks. <laughs> Have you thought of reversing the industry? <laughs> Start mining for moose? I mean, in a country in which you pay someone, I presume in a helicopter, unless they're being towed along by a flock of songbirds, uh, if you're paying people $8,000, uh, to shoot an invasive species and you're putting people out of work in, in the great oil fields of Alberta and getting $40 less per barrel, there is something unalterably strange going on in this country. Unalterably strange. Before I get to what I even might pretend to be relevant to this particular gathering, by the way, I, I'm, I'm digressing. <laughs> and I haven't begun. <laughs> Which is really difficult to do. You can't leave the path unless you're on it. <laughs> this, is, this is your Zen meditation for the afternoon. And you think that these are not learned seminars. Uh, I want to tell you something about Red Deer. Uh, one of the reasons, and it's genuine by the way, for as far as it's worth, one of the reasons that I got involved in this is something that had to do with Newfoundland. And I presume, by the way, there's probably 80% of you here are Newfoundlanders? <laughs> We contaminate every region of the globe. <laughs> One of the reasons was when we closed down the fishery uh, in the mid-90s. Uh, I'm going to make this really compressed. I, I could go on about it literally for hours. Uh, when we shut that down, that was the first time since 1497 that someone who was living in Newfoundland was not allowed to get in a small boat, not a dragger, get in a small boat, go out to the waters, drop a line, and a hook, bring up a codfish, bring it home, put it on the table, have supper. First time, I'm adding a bit, first time in about 500 years that the most basic cultural, economic, and domestic transaction of the entire population of Newfoundland was suspended. So it wasn't just economics. The whole idea of Newfoundland was the fishery. The outports became the outports because people went to the distant regions of the outside of the province to have their own fishing grounds. You don't know, and I'm not going to expand on it, you don't know how deep that was, that the cardinal element of Newfoundland's social, economic, linguistic, and cultural life was utterly suspended in a single day. And the next morning there were 31,000 inshore fishermen that were without work and their families disoriented. I met people when I covered that story that sold houses. I remember one gentleman on the Northern Peninsula. To this day, I see him at his dining room table. He had seven children. He sold his house for nine airplane tickets. And he went to Hamilton. I mean, double the tragedy. <laughs> so, so I give you that as, as, the, as the kind of blueprint. And this is also, it, is, it happens to be true, it doesn't make it any more powerful, but it is true that my closest friend, real, my really closest friend, uh, he got caught up in that malaise. He was about 55, so you know, you're not entirely, you know, with the spring feathers on the old chicken and when you're 55. They're starting to get moldy. <laughs> he's 55 years of age, he's married, he has two fairly grown kids, and suddenly he's out of work. It was a good marriage. I won't give any names. It's a good marriage. Stresses become stresses when you're unemployed. Do people forget what it is to have a job? It's not some light thing that happens. And if it's a job in farming, in fishing, or any of the resource industries, it usually has generational considerations. There's fathers and grandfathers and even great-grandfathers. It's something in the blood, as they say. So it's not just an economic shock. It's a shock to identity, to use a trendy word. Well, he was one of those. I'll collapse that story because, again, there are other points to be made. But it's really true. The marriage broke up. But home were fairly civilized. And even when they break up, they kept fairly friendly. There was no arguments. He gave the house, which he should have, incidentally. That's the way things should be. But he ends up, after 20-plus years of honest work, living in a basement apartment in Torskov. Now, some of you may have lived in a basement apartment. But you've never done it in Torskov. 
This is the intermediate point between purgatory and hell. <laughs> so here you are at the, at the very autumn and sunset of an otherwise productive life, acting like some displaced college student who was running away from his debt, and you're living in a basement apartment in Torse Cove. Well, pretty soon it was the lotto machines and the booze. That's what, these things happen. Your marriage, your family is gone, the trauma goes deep. The dignity of earning your own living. Haul that out of a person, male or female, young or old. And you've stolen something absolutely vital. Anyway, uh, not a hero in this, but I, did, I knew him, I loved him. And I said, you know, you gotta get out of here. And I remember, that's the only good thing Air Canada does, is supply me with air miles. <laughs> it's the only thing. <laughs> Your air miles don't count, it's mine that count. I gave him air miles to get a ticket to Calgary. His first job, he had worked in mines, another despicable occupation. He had worked in mines, <clears throat> he got a job in Red Deer. And in Red Deer, he called up his son, grade 11, no more, no work in Newfoundland. The son comes up, he goes to work roofing, roofing here. My buddy upgraded a bit, went up, I forget the name of the camp, but it's miles beyond Fort Mac. He was out in the damn tent in the winter. He's a tough bastard. <laughs> I mean, he really is a tough bastard. You should see him. Anyway, again, it claps the story. He kept doing that. He eventually ended up in Fort Mac proper, high paying job. And then this guy who came from the south coast of Newfoundland and who was wedded, he was wedded to the water. The idea he could be out of sight of the ocean was impossible to him. Then he ends up on the damn rigs off Nigeria. And in two or three more years, I'm getting a call from a fellow who lived on the south coast of Newfoundland and nowhere else. And you know where he's calling me from? He's calling me from the shower room of the first class lounge in Paris. <laughs> I hate the bastard. <laughs> he's now super elite. <laughs> He has more air miles than me. <laughs> anyway, all this is true. And the, the best part again, and it is the best part, and eventually I'll make this relevant so you'll see what I'm all about. The uh, best part about all this, marriage reconstituted. No, this is true. I'm not making it up. I'm not giving you a Disney story. It's the truth. The son, with a mere grade 11 in this new technological age, he went from roofing the heavy equipment, to the cranes, and then to the super cranes, and he's now down in Mexico on vacation. <laughs> I hate him too. <laughs> so, that's the positive side. Now, if you take that story, probably not as, as extreme, but you could multiply it by 10, 15, or 20,000, maybe more, of Newfoundland, never mind the rest of the country, just giving you a parable. And that's what it is. It's a parable of all. That, that was the amount that the economic good fortunes of that moment in Alberta overspilled and went to other provinces, and in the case of one province, in a moment of economic and cultural crisis, did a rescue job, a rescue job beyond the power of government, Government could not solve that. And it, here's the other thing, you guys, don't, and I'll suck up to you on this one. You guys, you guys don't get enough credit for it. When the uncivilized troops of my native land crossed all that other land mass and walked into your country, you didn't stop them. You should have. <laughs> it's, it, it, is, it is under acknowledged. It is under acknowledged that the workforce of a large part of the entire country came to this country, came to this province, was greatly welcomed. And here's the other thing, and Preston, to whom I shall soon refer, Preston will understand this perhaps better than I. 
We talk about confederation and the bonds of confederation and the celebration days. The great operations of confederation and the things that solidify it are on the ground. And it was the commingling of so many citizens from so many provinces, from the outpost, from the far north, from the cities, joining together and having co collision contact while working on a common project. This is the renewal on a person-to-person -person basis of the foundational exchange of the Canadian idea. There was a great social experiment involved in the Alberta oil sands to the benefit of renewing the fibers of the Confederation itself. And this is the kind of thing that Neil Young, with his vast grasp of history, calls Hiroshima. God keep him out of the wars. So, if you understand that, just that one thing, that there was a social dimension to the benefit of the entire nation that came from this vital industry here, you can now say, you look at it at, at the current moment, and you say, what is going on in this province? Stretches, no stretches, it, it breaks the boundaries of the understanding of the meaning of the word inexplicable. Yeah. I don't understand. It's not I'm against. It's not you don't want to jump on it. I just don't understand it. There's no, there's no gain anywhere. And having mentioned Preston, it is only right, you know, that the, 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 the poor disciple uh, pay some due acknowledgement to Moses. I've always, well, he is, by the way. Wake up to this, folks. When you hear these days, and you hear it all the time, I'm not going off theme, this is digression too, but I'm actually begun now. <laughs> when you hear off times about the need for civility and returning dignity to this and that and the other thing, you've been given all the lessons in civility and dignity and deportment and style and, and concentrating on ideas rather than partnership, partisanship by the example of Preston Manning as long ago as 20 and 25 years ago. He was the most dignified per presence in a house that normally doesn't know the meaning of the word. <laughs> and so, Preston Manning, for a number of reasons, I hold him in high and genuine esteem. And I, I have since the first moment that I met him. <laughs> he put a definite new inflection. He bent the arc of what was thought what is being thought, what is necessary to be thought about in the operation of Canadian politics. Now I go to the current moment. I mean, the inexplicabilities. I like to draw up what I call an inventory. I've given you the big one, the social one. You rescued the province. You, you amputated the potential misery of thousands before it occurred. But then there's the obvious ones. Uh, when Alberta was in full flight, we had the world recession. And Canada was the one country least affected by it. And the firewall, to use a good word, against that recession was the powerhouse of then, the then Alberta economic activity. Another national benefit. Aside from that, I've mentioned the confederation aspect, but there's one other thing. We're always dreaming about expanding the frontiers of Canada and reviving the national spirit. I mean, the, the, the celebrations of the 150th anniversary were a disgrace. Yeah. Yeah. Were, we, were we performing some sort of elaborate 365 day act of contrition? Yeah. It's a country that naturally inspires pride. It is exceptional on the face of the globe. Exceptional not because of us, because of the ones that built it before us. This is the truth. And one of the things that revives and gives energy to a country is the cooperation in great and natural projects. And I can't think, I often wonder, I, I do not know again what goes on. Uh, when you have something as valid as this, the technologies that are summoned to the, to the operation of the Alberta oil sands, the mines that have been in this province and brought into it, pushing the frontiers of what can be done, 
and at the same time supplying the cardinal, I mean that word, the absolutely quintessentially necessary, the cardinal resource of the entire civilization. It's energy. Without energy, there is nothing. We need food, we need air. And after that, energy. This civilization collapses without a ready and secure supply of the one primary resource that drives especially a computer age. And any other country of the world that housed the resources that we have would, would, would be conducting marathon races to get it developed and awarding gold medals to anyone who knew the meaning of the word pipeline. <laughs> one, of, one of the hard things that came out of all of this is that is also this is the psychological thing. It's one thing to have an industry have a downturn and perhaps have a federal administration that is more comfortable with butterflies flying into Elizabeth May's house to examine the tofu. <laughs> That's one thing. But it is another thing. It is another thing when a province that has made the contribution that it did, when it acted the perfect good citizen to the citizens of other provinces, also through no fault of its own, neither of, neither of foresight nor of mischief, through no fault of its own, then endures a succession of woes. I know that Preston is familiar with scripture. He wrote some of it. <laughs> God damn it. Sorry, I didn't mean that. <laughs> I never heard it till it came out. <laughs> oh, God. No. The side, aside from the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Job, A, apart from being perhaps, the great, if you're a literary, literary person, one of the greatest stories ever written, certainly is until Shakespeare, and it is better than some of Shakespeare, the last section is the high point of all eloquent literature. But I often think of Job when I think up here. You have the, the collapse of world prices to such a tr dramatic extent. That's the first hammer blow that falls on the oil sands. And then, whatever angry God Neil Young prays to, <laughs> decides, I think it's time to burn down Fort McMurray. You have the fire. You have a cataclysm. You have a conflagration. At the worst possible time for that to occur. And by the way, it also exemplified, as certain other really dark moments did, that the resources of citizens in impulsive and reflexive response to any genuine cal calamity shows the spirit of the country. I, I like to think of all the pickups going up there as the modern version of the, of the wagon train. It was a great thing to see so many people from the metropolitan areas and the small towns and the reservations, the whole collective, saying if there's one bunch of us in trouble, there's another bunch of us to help. The spirit of the place is alive and well. But oil prices decline, Fort McMurray gets savaged by a wildfire. And if that's not enough, about a month later, they asked me up there. <laughs> Gluttons. <laughs> Do you know something when I got this is the truth. They told me they just had a flood. I mean, no one had to face one. They had the fire, then they had the flood. And then you have, following on all of these things, you have this, the beginning of the flight of capital and the movement of the headquarters of companies, and the cancellation or, or shelving of projects. This in itself is, is an amazing uh, evacuation of all that's going on there. So you have down prices, you have fire, you have flood, and you have the flight of capital. And then, oh, by the way, I have a joke. 
I have one good joke. And I, 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 it just popped into this empty space. And I have to tell it to you. This is the funniest thing I've ever heard, and I think it's going to be the funniest thing that you ever heard. <laughs> do you remember when Justin Trudeau got elected? Well, I suppose you do. Uh, do you remember when Justin Trudeau got elected? One of the very first things he said, this is really telling. He said, one of the very first, this was one of those stern, composed, I'm intense statements. He said, I think it's time. He said, I think we have to, what was it? We have to restore the trust of the Canadian public in the National Energy Board. Now, I travel, I travel up here a bit. I get out occasionally to Prince George. I'm up in Labrador occasionally. I was up in Whitehorse. I mean, I, I, they, they throw me around a fair bit. And you walk into Prince George's any morning after, say, the Russia Hockey Series. You walk into the, 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 the mall, and you go up to the person, and he looks at you. Oh, Rex, what are you doing? He said, you know, by that National Energy Board, I, I don't... <laughs> I, I still can't trust it. <laughs> then you go into Peterborough in Ontario. You know, the, the, the gentlemen, the older gentlemen are gathered together, you know, in the morning over the coffee, and, you know, and there was a wildfire last night, and a tornado hit down in the center of town, and the first thing they're saying, you know, was that National Energy Board. <laughs> When are we going to be able to trust it ever again? <laughs> coast to coast. I remember the tsunami hit Indonesia. It was the third topic that we had on checkup. <laughs> the first topic was, when are we going to get our trust back in the National Energy Board? I'd like to know the pills that are taken to put him to sleep. <laughs> because what dreams may come. So you had that. And then, things are not getting interesting enough. Oh, now I've got to skip through all of these. You got Northern Gateway, gone in a flash. Hardly had time to even form the headline. Energy East. I live in the East. Not the East that you talk about, I live in the real East. <laughs> gone, snap of the finger. It wasn't, I don't even know that we talked about it. It was just gone. And we got oil traipsing across the high waters of the North Atlantic to zero their way up the North, the, 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 the St. Lawrence River, going through the sludge of a million sewer lines. <laughs> I mean, what is going on here? And then we have, of course, the great saga of the Trans Mountain. Uh, I, met, I met Ian Anderson. Ian Anderson was the guy in charge of that project. He's been, he was seven years. I mean, you had, if you're familiar with English uh, liturgical history, you've got to go back to Fox's Book of Martyrs <laughs> before you find someone that was dedicated to getting this thing done correctly. This man, I'm, I'm telling you personally, I've met him. He's one of the most decent human beings you've ever seen. He spent a year and a half going to every hamlet, every, every, every First Nation, open, taking the abuse, absorbing it, and gone. And then they, they lose all heart. And of course, we're still waiting for the National Energy Board to be really, really, really trustworthy. That's why we're having Bill C-69 brought into being. Yes, I know. So all of that. And at the end of that great parade, oh, Trans Mountain after seven years. Do you realize that it takes exponentially more time to get permission for a project than it does to build it. <laughs> We've gone into upside down land. Seven years to get, sorry you can't, and then the government of Canada buys the one that was already built 50 plus years ago, and we're now in another hiatus, while various great minds summon their wit and intelligence to determine whether it might be a good idea to go ahead. So there's the other blow that falls on the Alberta oil industry in the wake of all the great things that it has already contributed to Canada. Do you now see why I'm having trouble with the word inexplicable? <laughs> I don't understand it. Any other context, any other circumstance where you had this combination of plus and minus visiting a single jurisdiction 
and you would have the proper national response. Now, the anchor that fell on the already sunken vessel, the giant anchor that already fell on the very, very small sunken vessel, was when all of this had happened, and all outlets were closed, and oil could not go to any other market but the one down south, at that particular moment, when the, the body is laid out on the table and the two coins are in the eyes, <laughs> someone decides to say, this is a good time for a carbon tax. <laughs> They must, they must have seen a twitch in one of the fingers. <laughs> I mean, really? What is this? What is this? And I have one other point to, to really run through. I, I've never been able to get past this either. I'm not in, in the industry. I don't know its technicalities. I know a lot of the workers, by the way. That's the main thing for me. That's not just a polite way of saying something. I know what it means. I've seen it. So I, my buddy, I know what this actually means. Not in 2000 or 2100, when, I don't know, some great forest of doom comes into us from the IPCC and the other fantasists. Forget it. We live now. And if you can't take care of your own backyard, don't go fixing the global climate. Leave it alone. So you have this, and you say to yourself, the world cries out for the number one resource. The world cries out for it. It will have it. It is going to be produced. There is no question of that at all. And yet, in this particular context, the whatever is this fantasy, I, myself and Preston disagree on this. He's a better mind, so you probably should listen to him, but I got the microphone now. <laughs> and I say it is the present moment, and until such a time as the stresses that are brought about in a single region. And here's the other, this is the last, the last main thing. That it, if there were, I don't agree with it, I don't accept it. I think it's hyperbolic. I think it's fantastic. I think it's 80% propaganda, and I think it has more politics in it than it has science. Leave all that aside. But even if you agreed with the prophecies of doom, which have been present since the age of, of, of Confucius, if you agreed with those things and the apocalypse is upon us, it's not going to be brought about by one resource extraction project in northern Alberta. But what I will tell you, and I defy anyone to name the other, it is the only project, the only project that has been the object and the target of global opposition, national and international, for the better part of 15 years. You can go to Nigeria, Venezuela, Norway, Africa, Latin America, Mexico, any country of the world that's involved in the oil industry, and you cannot point to one other project that has become so emblematic of the, of the final days of the great eco-catastrophe that happens if you, if you put some unleaded oil in the wrong vehicle. This is insane. Fort Mac was made the deliberate emblem of an alarmist and scare campaign, and you did not have national politicians, either progressive or liberal. We could have no hope for the NDP. You had no national politicians picking up the campaign for you. Where has been the voice that said, from the Prime Minister on down? This is a national operation. This is not a, a, a local project. And the delivery of oil <laughs> from, a, uh, from a 21st century rule-bound country, one of the most secure and, in, in some ways, one of the most responsible countries of the world. Why are you not speaking up for its foundational element, energy? And then the last little rider, just, I never understand this. We need it for cars. We need it for houses. We need it for the army. We need it for our security. We need it for our internet lines. All the energy that goes out and goes to all these other industries who then use them 
You don't start the fire under the gas. The automobile does. But it's the people who deliver the product, product that everyone is demanding that then has to bear the blame. Do you see that this is upside down? When there was a threat in the US trade talks that the auto pack might get hit, it was like a convulsive shock to the Laurentian elites. My God, we're going to stop our cars. What do cars run on? <laughs> Then you have Bombardier, which spends, which spends it, which, no, 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 which spends its entire lifetime in the emergency care ward of government handouts, <laughs> undelivering rail cars to Toronto, and building planes. What do planes fly on? Are there carbon taxes on Bombardier? Are there carbon taxes on the auto plant? Are there carbon taxes on the oil and gas coming in? <laughs> are there carbon taxes on the non-existent pipelines that are not being built? <laughs> this is insane. How I got to, I'm almost finished by the way, you should be relieved. <laughs> Do you not realize that the other element that plays into all of this is that for some reason, and this is, this is actually the key point, I think, I don't know how it happened, Maybe because we are temperate, or maybe because we don't like too much to be quarrelsome per se, but somehow or other this dread scenario, dreamt up from the days of Morris Strong, backed by a propaganda machine, the like of which I, the only thing I do know about is communication. That's the only thing. And I tell you, I know a campaign when I see one. And I've seen this for 20 years, and it reaches everywhere. And now we're in this, this tidal wave of, 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 of timidity called political correctness when we're not allowed to talk about the weather. This is what climate change is. It's a goddamn weather. <laughs> and you can't say, well, I don't believe it's going to end in 2100 or you're a heretic. Where did this happen? No, somehow or other the industry, the people who work in the industry, the province that hosted the industry, absorbed some of the negative vibrations and thought it not good form to combat the malignant propaganda, with the result being that they have had 20 years of preconditioning, and only now in a moment of high stress and undeniable reality, reality will end eventually change even the most befogged mind. And now that it comes down to this, here's to the ultimate joke. Finally, the people in the industry, the people in the province, and I think, by the way, a large number outside of the province are starting to wake up to this, that God or the creator or nature that so endowed us with, with such plenty that other countries would weep to have, and we are sitting on one and blocking it, while rogue nations and terror nations, and I'm not getting into ethical. Oil is not ethical or non-ethical. It's a cardinal resource. It's energy. And somehow or other, we're too holy to take it from the ground. That's smugness. That's not virtue. We're too pure. Oh, let's, let's ban plastic straws. <laughs> and we'll all go to A&W heaven. <laughs> when an entire city council sits down and bans plastic straws, they don't have anything else to do. I met a guy here. I'm now in progression three. I met a, a guy here. And he was taken in on one of these heli things to one of those peaks that you can't get to otherwise. And there was a resort there. He's on the top of one of the Alpine Rocky Mountains. God knows how far inland, in the middle of all that stone and granite, you know, between three and four foot miles high. And he goes into this resort that you got to have hostages to be able to afford to buy, get into it. <laughs> and he, he goes in and he sees the sign at the front desk. You know, clients, please note that, you know, we're in, in the hope of keeping the oceans clean and uh, marine life from strangulating. Uh, we, have banned, uh, we have banned plastic straws. This is only two months ago. We banned plastic straws. <laughs> and he said, he thought about it. He's, he's on the top of a mountain that he could only get to by helicopter. <laughs> he's inland. He's a good way inland. He went up to the front desk. He said, uh, if you had a plastic straw here, how would it get to the ocean? <laughs> I mean, we become lunatic. <clears throat> we become lunatic. Let me, I know you've had a long day. Let me wrap it up and put it in, in, a, in, a, in a kernel. 
I think it has to be reversed. I think the flow of current has to be reversed. The, the posture has always been defensive. Defensive is always a way of losing gradually. You have a case. You have provided a civil, a civil benefit to an entire country. Uh, for a while, you were the backstop of the financial consideration. One of the few places that still has a classic understanding of what it means to have a job, to have purpose, to, it is always better to support yourself than to be supported. It is always better to work than not to work. It is always better to have that dignity that comes from the fact that you provide for yourself or family than to have it supplied from somewhere else. These are truths so old that they existed before writing itself. So there's another reason. But the idea that a coterie of NGOs and, and fly-by-night organizations and green corporations, which, by the way, are as big as any of your oil firms, have somehow owned this debate and that governments have, have so far flexed their knees in genuflection to them and uh, they have owned the conversation and the direction of it? Uh, no. I don't think that the oil worker or the oil company or the citizens who support them have a case to prove to them they have a case to prove to you. Who gave you standing? How many jobs have you created lately? When the oil term, I often, this is another thought I often have, when an oil decline occurs, and 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000, everything from engineers to the, the, the most basic laborer, when they lose their work, how many people in the NAB lose their job the same day? How many people in Greenpeace are laid off the same day? How many of the professional communications organizations that run their community, do they lose their jobs? No one loses their jobs who actually is out there opposing the project. You bear the burden. They never have to bear anything. The simplest word to say in the entire English language is no. And if you can name, and I know this is not necessarily a friendly audience to them, but if you can name one single project, howsoever small, across this entire once dominion that has received a yes from one environmental organization. I'll go visit it and then stay Christmas there. <laughs> it doesn't exist. They live to say no. And their no's are always ulterior. If it's, oh, it's going to doom the planet. Oh, OK, they went ahead. Well, pipelines. When did pipelines become a terror? My god, they're tubes. They're big straws. <laughs> I know that this province uh, feels these woes. Uh, I'm not, I am not a partisan, uh, but I do respect Jason Kenney. Uh, say it personally. I won't kill him with an endorsement. <laughs> but I will, say, I will say this, you know, we, we, we have a lot of lackadaisical bastards running around uh, on Parliament Hill. I have a lot of people who go there just because of the glamour and the glory. Uh, he puts in the time, he puts in the hours. I, I don't even have to go into the notion of policy. Uh, there's so much honest dedication to the actual performance of the role. And you can have all sorts of speculation but the thing is, look at what is being there, what is in front of you. Uh, I think in that sense, there's no question. The energy, I, I once was at a speaking engagement. He showed up at 9 o'clock. I find one of these a day. You know, I'm an antique. Where's me? I was around when they were manufacturing linen for the mummies. <laughs> and he shows up at 9 o'clock, and I'm the speaker, and he gives a speech. And that's his third one that night. He's going off to two more. If I could splice that DNA, I might have another, <laughs> another couple of years. But I'll go back to it. This province, from what I'm hearing, I don't live here, you know, is suffering a psychological or cultural yeah. blow. Uh, it is depressing to see that, after all, I've spelled it out, that there's not more release of national emotion coming in this way and saying, boys, you know, no, you're having a rough patch. Is there anything really we can do? Uh, uh, by the way, this, this manic desire to choke the entire oil fields up, we know that's crazy. 
We know also it would be much better to send oil off to the East Coast from, from, from Alberta than it is to get it from Saudi Arabia. I mean, that's, that's understood. So, and as, as far as allowing the objectors, those who do nothing, who offer nothing, who provide no jobs, who will know, they will, they will change nothing on the landscape except continue the misery. Why, they have a voice equal or stronger than those who in good times help the country and in bad times need assistance. That's wrong. And that's how I came up with that little thought that Jason was good enough to, to plagiarize and pilfer at the beginning. Uh, until the day comes, until the day comes that there are pipelines, plural, built, and oil flowing through them to markets other than the US, it should become illegal to press two lips together to form the consonants and roll the vowels of the phrase carbon tax. <laughs> Okay. Now that I've been in the back, I've got one little tiny story left. <coughs> it's only 90 seconds, and I, I've told it a thousand times. I have no invention. It was told to me, by the way, did, remember I, I was telling about my friend? This got truth. It was told to me by him. Uh, it was, it's over, Preston's heard it ten times, because he's, he's, a, he's a masochist. He comes to these things often. <laughs> well, I got a phone call from Newfoundland, and he told me this little yarn. And I said, I thought to myself, he's putting me on. I'm going to, he's, I'm going to write that. And then he's going to phone me up and say, I made it up. <laughs> but no, it's true. Which doesn't make it any more interesting, by the way. <laughs> Whenever you hear the phrase from someone in front of a microphone saying, by the way, this story is true, that's a signal that the speaker already knows it's not very good. <laughs> it's probably not interesting, and you're not going to find it amusing. So I want to under underline here, this is true. <laughs> this is really true. I'm making a short version. 1997, it is true. 1997, we invited Queen Elizabeth II to come to Newfoundland because in 1497, John Cabot from Venice, Italy, was in Bristol, England, and he persuaded someone to finance an expedition to Beijing, or Peking then, as it was, China. And he left. After some months, he ended up in Bonavista, Newfoundland. This is a feat of some considerable marine error. It, it's the kind of thing we celebrate. <laughs> it, it may account for some of the premiers we elect. <laughs> I think of Williams. <laughs> anyway, by the way, even in, this, even in the 15th century, it was pretty hard to mistake Bonavista for Peking. <laughs> it wasn't until 1987 that Bonavista even had a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> anyway, the, the big deal is she came over, she accepted. We were the oldest colony, Britain's oldest colony. So she actually came, royal visit. Camera crew from all over the world. I mean, it, it was a real royal visit. Sent me down from Toronto. I had a camera with camera crew. We were up in Bonavista. It was awful. Rain, snow, sleet, fog, winds, icebergs, more fog. June the 24th. <laughs> you couldn't see her. There was an impenetrable veil of global warming in front of her. <laughs> well, no, you couldn't see her. They, you wouldn't know she was there. So this was not a success. Royal visit, absent queen. So we're a quick people. We said we're going to fix it. We'll bring her to St. John's, get her out of Bonavista right away, and we'll bring her indoors. It doesn't snow very often indoors in Newfoundland. <laughs> Not often, a bit of fog. And we'll bring her to a place that every Newfoundlander understands and knows and has a, has a bond with. Something like Tim Hortons multiplied by 100 in Canada. <laughs> and it's a biscuit factory. It's true. We grew up hard bread, purity biscuits. I'm Catholic. I grew up on purity round milk lunch biscuits. <laughs> My friend Leo White, who's Protestant, and besides going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
That's right, isn't it, Preston? <laughs> Besides going to hell, he grew up on purity square milk lunch biscuits. I'm making the point that in Newfoundland, regardless of denomination, regardless of background, there was a purity biscuit for everyone. That's why she's going to the biscuit factory. Now I got most of the story clear to get to the point. She comes in, there's a dais much higher than this, and in front of it there are three steel vats filled each with 3,000 pounds of warm biscuit dough. And it's being twirled by giant blenders that are controlled by a gentleman on the dais. He's wearing a white coat and he has some buttons connected to a, a wire and he presses the buttons and the blenders twirl the biscuit dough. And she's on the dais now, she got her purse, so she's on a tilt. <laughs> There's a flat iron in that purse. So she's leaning her way across the aisle and she comes to Buddy and she, I can't do the accent. But she looks up at him and I remember where she is. I spent a lot of time driving it home. She looks up at Buddy and she says, and what are you making, sir? There is a pause. As long as the Reformation. <laughs> and Buddy finally looks down and says, thirteen fifty an hour, ma'am. <laughs> for, for years after my sympathy was with the House of Windsor <laughs> anyway I should say it again two or three things um, it's very welcoming it really is uh, I think your dilemma I'm just shorthanding your dilemma is absolutely real I think the response to it, as I keep saying, my word in this case is inexplicable, but it's also criminal. I, I think that there would be a boon, regardless of parties, forget the partisanship. If the parties or, or the instruments of government, government opposition would say, hey, you know, let us attend to something that is daily inflecting the fortunes and the feelings of so many Canadians. I mean, back in Newfoundland, we're still also suffering the outcrop, the out, 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 out effects of the closures in Fort Mac. My buddy is, by the way, the one I talked about first, his son is still employed. He's been out of work now for three years. This is not local. So while you are under the banner, as I said, here's my, who am I to give advice? But I will give this much. It is time to reverse the current. All of this up to this point, they can pile on, they can say this, let's have another study, let's get a few gulls to fly into that damn pond. By the way, gulls have GPS. They had it before we did. They can leave a branch in, in northern Ontario and land on a petal in Mexico. So what are they doing flying into the only six square inches of all of North America to dirty their damn feathers? <laughs> if someone mentions those effing ducks again, I'm going to lose my temper. <laughs> you, you guys are guys of enterprise. You've always had a sense of individuality, which is a great thing in these days. You do have, I think, control. You're among those who are most visibly, most exuberantly patriotic. I like this, incidentally. And I think that all of these things combined, you know from your own history what you have built. Take confidence in what you've already done. I mean, this, 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 this province now is, 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 is anything in North America or Europe. I mean, you're there. Look at this college itself. So take heart from what you have already achieved and regardless of this particular valley, and regardless of the carelessness of the political climate that allows it to extend itself, reassure yourselves that you're better than your enemies and that these hard times will go away. Take care. Sure, sure. Amen.